Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending um, the IIS launch webinar series, Demystifying the Wealth Management Industry. I'm Wei Chen, and today I'll be your host. This afternoon, we are really fortunate to be able to invite down Mr. Randy An from PIAS to address some of the common queries that some of us might have towards the wealth management industry. Being in this field for more than a decade, he brings along with him a wealth of experience working with financial consultants and investment managers. And he will be answering some of the common queries that about the wealth management industry, as well as offering some feedback from his experience in this sector. And also today, we also have our two undergraduates, We Wen from NDU. Can you say hi to the audience, Wei Wen? Hello. As well as Yi Xin from SMU. Yi Xin, please. Hello. And both of them have some um, burning questions about the industry to ask about anything, such as how is wealth management different um, from the insurance scene? Okay, I guess it's about time we get right to it. Now I'll pass the ball to Yi Xin for the first burning question. Yi Xin, please. Thanks, Wei Chen. So, uh, hi Randy, can you share with us a bit more about your background and what you do in your current company? All right, hi, hello everybody. Uh, good afternoon, thanks for joining us and thank you very much ISS for inviting me to share with you a bit more about this industry. All right, um, my name is Randy and I'm in PIS. So let me bring you back, uh, back a little bit about um, what's my journey like, all right? I have prepared some slides for today. So just give me a moment while I do a quick share. Okay, uh, I graduated in NTU. So I'm an alumnus of NTU um, back in 2007. So after graduation, I started my career as a computer engineer. Um, why? Because I studied computer engineering. So it's really very technical. We talk about software and stuff like that. So back in this DSTA, the Defense Organization with uh, Singapore. I do a bit more on um, programming, software engineering, and also more on uh, systems analyst kind of role, right? So two years with them, and I felt I felt uh, I felt a bit bored. So it's a very desk bound job where you keep talking to computers. So and it's also the period whereby there was a financial crisis. You know, back in 2009, 2008, that's where the Lehman Brothers collapsed. If some of you could remember. So at this juncture, I, I felt that maybe I should try sales, you know, I mean, since, since there's a crisis happened, everything is going rock bottom, I believe people will be keen to get something up, you know, with the economy. So back in 2009, I started my career as an insurance agent. So I, I started doing more, um, more in, in, in insurance and also start to build a team. So over time, uh, fast forward five years, uh, back in 2014, I was successfully promoted into a group director. And here is a small photo of me and my managers. And another couple of years later, in 2019, last year, I actually took a career break. So I left, I left, I, I decided to spend a bit more time with the family. And then this year, in 2020, I started my work again back in this industry in wealth management under PIAS, Professional Investment Advisory Services. So over here, what I do is that I'm an executive financial services manager. And basically we do a lot more into wealth management and, and also more into individuals and corporate services. Yep, that's probably me in short. I think your story is really a reminder that anyone from a non-finance background as an undergraduate can still enter the wealth management industry. And now that you're still, uh, now that you're in the wealth management industry, uh, what exactly is wealth management? And because many associate wealth management with insurance, do you actually, uh, do you think that this is actually true? Okay, in fact, um, wealth management is a very broad, broad topic. Uh, one of the key reasons why, why I chose PIS was because I'm able to do wealth management specifically because of the range of uh, services that, that we do provide. All right, 
Uh, so sorry about the technicalities. <laughs> yeah, uh, as, I, as I was saying, um, earlier I was mentioning that wealth management is in fact a very wide topic. And yes, a very a subset of wealth management or one of the components of wealth management is actually financial planning. And financial planning is basically just another term for insurance planning. But wealth management is not just about insurance planning. So what else do we have under wealth management? Wealth management also looks after your investments, money, assets, and cash. So in, 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 this, in this realm, realm right, uh, basically we, we touch a lot on finances, like how is your money being managed? Um, how should your investments be diversified? How do you grow your money? And how do you protect yourself using uh, insurance? How do you do your risk management, right? But then it doesn't stop there you know, for wealth management. In fact, it expands even further. So wealth management also looks into a lot of other factors. We, we talk about econom economic factors, like currently the situation today um, with COVID-19 running all over the place. Um, we are having a very bad economic downturn at, at this moment of time. And that's where we step in to help to manage the wealth. We, we take a look into the portfolio and we, then we suggest what should we do at, at today's time. I mean, is it, is it a time to enter the market? Is it a time to restructure what you already have? or should you exit the market at this juncture? So this is what we do. When, when things change, when there's a shift, we, we step in and we manage. We, we do the wealth management for, for our clients. On top of that, there's also the trade. So when we talk about trade, it's really a lot more uh, to, the, to the corporate side of things, whereby if you're in the industry, and I mean, with whichever industry you are, you are in, there's, there's more to be trade movements. For example, say, Maybe you are in the IT industry. So at, at, at this moment of time, IT industry is not exactly affected. In fact, it's booming, regardless of COVID or not COVID. All right. So lastly, we also check in into the profits. I mean, over here, we've got to be real, real with ourselves, right? Everybody who, who does wealth management, the end goal is really to have an enhancement of wealth at the same time protecting your risk. So in, in, in short, well, management is really a very wide subject. And yes, insurance is a part of wealth management, but wealth management does not represent insurance completely, right? Who we'll answered that point clearly? Moving on, uh, I'd like to ask you what you think your biggest challenge and reward in your years of working in wealth management is. Well, okay. Um, there, are, there, are, there are a lot of challenges, but let me see. Okay. My biggest challenge is really about relationships. I mean, okay, when I, when I, when I first started out, it, it, was, it really wasn't easy because I'm, I'm on the desk mount job, I'm in engineering and I face the computer. So coming from a technical perspective, shifting all the way into a, a, a role whereby I do, I do sales, I do advisory, uh, it, it's, it's really a, a big shift. Previously, I have relationships with only the computer and now I need to develop relationships with individuals, with human beings. So, so having the facing the relationship portion is, is really not, not easy. But why I say that is is so difficult because when it comes to wealth management, right? The the part on managing it, the part on helping you to manage your wealth is, is in fact not, not as challenging. But the part whereby I need to build your your trust in me, I need to build your belief in me. I need to build our, our relationship so that it's strong enough whereby you can allow me to assess what you have and allow me to advise you and for you to take, take on and listen to me. It's, 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 the, it's really something that, that puts a challenge to our business. Because for, for us, whenever, have you ever encountered this situation whereby you, you, ask, you ask somebody, maybe your relative or or your close friends, you ask them, hey, what, how, how much do you earn, actually? No, most of them will just tell you, you say, ah, no, la, no, la, no, la. maybe not as much as you. Or, yeah, no, 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 I a lot. So a lot of people are very typical because they are very sensitive to their own finances. And it's something that's very personal to, to an individual. So being able to, to break this barrier and enter into the inner space, understanding them better and knowing how they like their finances to be managed and helping them to manage that, for them to review everything that they have. It, 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 it takes a lot, it takes a lot, and it's not easy. So on, on, on this aspect, this challenge is in fact also my reward. Because as I over, overcame this challenge, 
I, I receive my maximum returns, my maximum rewards. I mean, we have we have strangers. We have, we have, we have met a new person, a new, a new client. We, we don't really know each other well. So we start to develop the relationship and we start to build the trust. So when you have a stranger turn into a friend or rather a stranger turn into a client and subsequently over the years, the client becomes a friend, you, 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 appreciate, you appreciate this a lot, really. And, and, it, and it, to me, it, it feels... It feels like well, already you you have really achieved achieved a lot, and having having that friend by your side, having having this this new 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 found friend, and being able to be there together with them going through their journey in life, it, it, it makes a very big impact and a very big difference in this in this career. So for for me, on this while, although the challenge is to build the relationships, but the relationships are the one that give me the most rewarding. Uh, experience that I ever had over my past past experiences so far, and I, I look forward to more such experiences because being able to help help somebody, being able to help somebody, being able to meet that person, my my friend, and being able to see them succeed in life, see them do better and better, and me myself being part of their journey, it, it, it gives me a very strong sense of fulfillment. Yeah. Um, I'm very sure that. The next question is very relatable as an undergraduate myself. So, so what I want to know is that the finance industry is often seen as a cutthroat industry due to the commission-based nature of most of the work here. And do you think that this is true? And how, how do you think that perhaps a, work, a healthy work culture can be balanced with performance? Okay. Um, yes, because... I have to agree that it is really a country industry because of the way that we are we are being paid. So most of us are paid through commissions and fees, and this this relates a lot back to our revenue. So sometimes to to really reach there, you uh, some some of our peers actually went through uh, a, a, a different route. So they they really go all the way just to get the business. But I felt like in this industry, right? Although there are people who, who really control, I mean they, they do whatever it takes so as they get an option. But I'm, I'm I'm glad that this is a small group. Most of us are actually very professional. And you need to understand that so long as you're professional, so long as you are true and you build the relationships and you do what you what you feel is correct. When, when we say what you do what you feel is correct, that means whatever that you do, right, you will do the same to yourself. So if you put yourself in that in that person's shoe, and given that, that situation, will you have done the same thing that you have advised? You, you, you can't be advising, giving, giving somebody an advice and then you go ahead, the next, the, the next thing that you do is you turn around and then you go and do the immediate opposite of what you just tell someone to do. I mean, that's that like so wrong, right? So, so what you do is, as long as, long as you're really doing the right thing and, and, you, and you preach what you do, you, 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 you'll be good, you'll be good. I mean, I, I, over the years, I, I get to build myself to where I am today. It's not because I control the industry. Or, or rather, it's not because I, I, I did whatever, I take, whatever it takes I did, whatever I, I, I need to earn that commission. No, I, I, I don't do that. You know, we, we, we do things the right way. We do things the, the correct, correct way. And, and we are able to answer to, to ourselves. So we, we feel you have to act professional and you need to have a very strong integrity in, in, the, in this business so that people can trust you. You know, the moment we receive that kind of trust, that means that you can really, in fact, you do whatever you can. I mean, you, you, you can do whatever you want, but whether or not what you do is going to be beneficial or not beneficial to the, to the client or, or to your friend, it's really up, depends, on, depends on you. That's why they trust you. So in order to, once you have that trust, right, you need to really do things correctly. And so long as you're doing it correctly, we are, we are, not, we are not afraid that uh, performance will not come in or you won't earn the money. Because in, in, in life, sometimes money comes along as long as you're doing things correctly and you're doing it the right way. You, you don't need to rob a bank to, to earn a lot of money, right? Sometimes even when you rob a bank, you don't, you don't get as much <laughs> for, for some who actually are earning a lot more. I mean, just, just for example, re re recently or just uh, yesterday, our Minister of Finance just announced a, a budget uh, budget and a new budget and he, he actually shared that the total budget that we have announced for this year accumulates up to 97 billion 
So that, that is, that's really a lot of money. But you compare that, you compare that to, to some of the richest people in this world today. For example, say um, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, the owner of Amazon. 97 billion is probably like what? Half of his net worth. So, so what, 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 what does this say? I mean, sometimes what, what, what I'm trying to tell is that we, we, do not, we do not go low to earn, to earn money. We do what is right, we work hard, and, and we don't go around cheating, right? So, so long as you're doing things the right way, you have strong integrity, and you work on the trust that you have, and you build the relationships, trust me, you will be able to earn your keep, and you will do way better than earning just your keep. You'll be, you'll be earning a lot more, because the more people trust you, the more people like you, the more the better you do. Naturally, your business will grow. This is a, this is a people's business. It's so so it's, it's it's just all about relationships and all about all about individuals, right? Yeah, I think this is absolutely important to take note of, especially in this competitive environment. So what you need to keep in mind of is the end goal that you want to achieve, and what's more important is the attitude and culture you want to be uh, you want to create and be a part of. Yeah. So the last question from me would be, why do you think this is a suitable job for undergraduates like myself to take up while they are schooling? Okay, for, for undergraduates, right, I, I, I felt that, you know, back then when I was a student, I, I tried a lot of stuff. I mean, um, I, I started a little bit late, so uh, I, I, tried to, I tried to dabble in many, many, many different things. Because one thing that I learned during school is that, right, um, believe it or not, whatever that you do, be it right or wrong, you are always given a chance, you're always forgiven. And and frankly, as a as a, as a student back then, right, when I when I fear in in small little ventures, right, everyone around me just encourages me. Tell hey, hey, Randy, don't worry, you're still young. Come on, you're just a student. You're already doing very well by by giving this a shot already. So not not, not to worry, just try again. Keep keep going, you know. So it's, it's, it's very encouraging because as, as a as a student back then, you most people have the have the thinking that a student may mainly just study. But actually, in fact, when you're a student, right, you should take this opportunity to enrich your life as much as possible. So what do I mean by by saying that? I mean that go go out there, go out there and and create as much um draw as much experiences as you can and get involved as much as as much as you can. So in, in our industry, right, uh, being a being a wealth wealth man, being in wealth management, right, in fact, don't don't take up don't really take up a lot of time and you are able to do it um, as and when you like during the time when you are free. So, and I also said earlier that it takes time to develop relationships. You need to build trust and all, right? So, starting out as an undergrad in this wealth management career actually does give you a little bit of a head start. Why? Because you have the flexibility of time and it's really a, a very effort-based uh, industry whereby the, the, more, the more time you spend, the better you do. But you don't really need to succeed immediately upon joining. But instead, you probably want to take this opportunity to, as, to learn, to build your knowledge, and to build the relationships and trust that you can, you can have with many, many, as many individuals as possible. Take that time to do networking. Because you're in school, you have a lot of, you have, um, a lot of friends around you. Just imagine this. When you're studying, you build a, you build a base. You build a base of what? You build a base of networking, you build a base of relationships, you build a base of trust. And you also gain knowledge over time. And you go through all the various uh, trainings in all the solutions and all the products that they can offer. At the point of your graduation, all your peers around you will all start to start to work. So as they start to work, they start to have income. And from there, because you have already built the relationship prior, naturally you'll be the go-to person. When, when they have a wealth to be managed. I mean, when it comes to wealth management, we do not scrutinize individuals. I mean, if you have $100, I can see what I can do with $100. You have $100 million, I will see what I can do with $100 million. So it really doesn't matter. I'm, I'm not talking about you, you need people who are very rich before you can even help them. No. In fact, the, the lesser well-off ones are the ones that really need help in management. Why? Because they really, they really don't have a lot. So imagine if they lose it all, they have nothing left. Right. So, so this, this group of people are, are the ones that really need, need more help in. But of course, 
because we're commission based, so we, we don't really earn, earn that much if if you only have clients in, in this in this group, which is why we always try to grow our clients together with us. As you as you help as you help uh, clients and friends to build their wealth, right? Naturally, your pot will get bigger and they will also put more money with you. And and, and that, that will just grow together. So in short, as a as an undergrad, it's a it's a very it's a very great opportunity if you can step into this this industry because you will learn a lot and and we all must have must have heard that this is one of the toughest industry to even survive in. So imagine that you enter the toughest, even if you were even if you were successful, you will somewhat grind yourself and grow a lot more tremendously in a short period of time. Yeah. Thank you so much for your insights. Hi Randy, in sum, so it seems like a relatively safe space to enhance work experience for students and hone soft skills to supplement your CV to seem more attractive to future employers, as long as you manage your time properly. But what is the career progression in wealth management like? For example, what kind of goals can a newbie in the industry work towards? Oh, okay. Um, when it comes to career progression, uh, generally there's about uh, two paths that you can take. Uh, let, me, let me show you the, the, various, the various path that's there. Okay, so this is a, the first path is actually an advisory path. Mm. When, when, you, when you first join the business, what you, your role is basically a financial advisor representative. Right, so, so you, start to, you start to learn how to do risk management, try to learn how to do financial planning and, and stuff. So over, over time, as, as you grow better, you will cover more aspects. Remember earlier on the slide, we talked about wealth management, where wealth management is encompass of so many aspects. So when you start, right, you start from financial planning, right? This is the core advisory business. So you start from financial planning. And from there, as you, as you go better, right, being a financial consultant, you start to dabble more into investments, money, assets, and cash. Yeah, so, so you will grow your knowledge, you grow your core, you grow your business. So it's, it's, it's akin to maybe first as start year when you have a, a few clients who do simple financial planning like you want to plan for savings you want to plan for basic life insurance or you want to plan for medical medical costs so you, you start you start with that then as you progress you become a financial consultant you start to look into um, the, the wider the, the wider perspective that means you, you talk about things like uh, creating a legacy leaving behind a legacy how about uh, you talk about maybe like say uh, wealth preservation well, preservation for for in individuals who are, who are at the at the peak of their career, and then the, and then you can also dabble into um, wealth accumulation, whereby whereby you look into how to grow an individual's um, finances and individual's wealth. Then, as you move on, you take on the role of a senior senior financial consultant. That that is where you you are really the expert in wealth management. That means you, you step in, you give very strong advice, you, you give very good advisory to individuals and corporations. So you start to dabble more into, into other other school, other other aspects of the business. For example, when I, when I move into, into corporate, right? Uh, when I start to get the notion of corporate, you, you, you're suddenly exposed into a whole different spectrum. You, you start to touch into things like trade, profit, whereby you look into the PL of a company. And you can actually advise them on how to manage their risk, and at the same time, how to how to do their how to better manage their excess cash within the within the firm itself. And we also talk into how to enhance enhance the employee benefits, how to make your staff be more productive. So the, the once you are an expert in this domain of wealth management, the spectrum actually grows automatically, and that is where you get progression in your career. That is one of the paths that we can take on. The next one is what I call a management path. So in the management path, you instead of just doing well management itself and fronting clients, you actually progress into a manager or a director over time. So what's the what's the difference in role between a, a consultant or a manager director? The key difference is really that instead of just handling clients yourself, you actually manage the team. You manage a team of consultants. So, so your, your job scope immediately 
expanded. So now, now instead of just talking to customers, bringing new revenue or even assisting our, our customers with their advisory, you actually need to look into um, hiring, hiring on new hires, new consultants, go look into how we're going to train them, go look into how we're going to manage the business model. That means uh, how you're going to enhance their revenue and what are the areas of this business where we can they can look into to get even more, more new clients. You, you talk about client acquisition on, on, a, on a group level. And as you progress into a senior senior director, you, you, you start to look into it as a business completely. It, 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 it's, it's like you're moving from a, a relationship manager or a accounts executive into a, a team lead or, or your accounts manager where you manage a couple of accounts as you lead and you and you probably will hold on to a to the larger larger clientele which are more critical to your overall revenue. And as you move into a director, you are probably the kid of the head of sales within, within, within the company within the organization. Right? Yeah. But your top doesn't stop there because many a times um, this, this is within this industry. But why, why earlier I also encourage that undergraduates can actually start, start on this, this career. Why? Because many a times, right, um, in our industry, people, people, come, people come and people go. People leave after maybe like two years or five years thing. Why do they leave? Because after learning, after learning so much, after building up their own skill set, and, and they, after they have um, groomed themselves, perfectly or, or, or in fact after they led a team. The opportunity that they have out of this wealth industry, right? Wealth management industry is actually tremendous also. Because what we have here in wealth management is frontline. But then there is a back end also. Like for example, you can actually move move back end and you can start to do claims. You can start to do compliance and you, you can probably even start to uh, manage technology if, if there's an area that you're keen in. So the, the possibilities of um, career tracks is, is really a lot, a lot. That means it's not just about um, wealth management, but this, this component of wealth management, in fact, can give you a very strong case start. Some choose to case start here and they move back end, or they take their expertise and they move on into a different domain. Say you join a FinTech company, but prior to joining a FinTech company, you actually did all this wealth management beforehand. So when you join the finance company, you actually bring a very strong, valuable asset with, with, with you because of your domain knowledge that you have. And when you enter into that different firm, you can give that a very different perspective. Yeah. So that, that's that's how many individuals actually learn how to how to move and how to transcend. This is this is more towards uh, of course career goals planning already. But for, for us in well management, specifically on the on the front line point of view, we are looking at these are the two main ones. And outside these two main ones, we have a whole range that is that's available, right? Oh, so the career progression is different for the different routes in wealth management. How about in general? Will the market be very saturated? Because there seems to be a lot of financial consultants these days. Huh, okay. Uh, th this is a very common question. I mean, a, a, lot, a lot of people ask me whether uh, is this in this industry, is this wealth management industry still um, still viable. I mean, like everywhere you turn, uh, you, you, walk, you walk on the streets, you, you ask a friend, hey, so what are you doing now? Oh, I just joined. I just joined an insurance company. Or, oh, I just joined a bank in uh, do, doing uh, relationship management. So it's, it's, it's like everyone around me is like doing finance already. So has, is, is this a saturated market? This is, let me show you some statistics. All right, uh, I plugged this out from the Life Insurance Association. Of Singapore, and this is actually dated just last week. <laughs> it's, it's on twenty second of May, twenty twenty. So they did a count. They did actually they actually did a count, and they realized that as of as of then, right, uh, at the end of quarter one, twenty twenty, that means the end of March, the total number of agents or representative of, of financial industry, right, that is holding on to exclusive contracts means they are actually tied to a insurance company. you are looking at fourteen thousand six hundred. Okay, so these are all your agents, right? If you were to add in, if you add in the all the financial advisors like um like like myself, the the individuals in PIS and, and some other firms uh, 
in the in the market. We roughly have about total about maybe around twenty thousand to twenty two thousand, right? So for twenty two thousand um, employment strength, right? Versus a clientele base in Singapore that's looking at a number of about what around close to what five million. You're, 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 talk, you're, you're looking at actually there's still a very huge gap available. Let me just give you an example of what I mean, a huge gap. Okay, back in November 2018, we, we did a we did a statistic study. On this year itself, right, 17, 70 thousand Singaporeans are in addition are covered by shoe plans. Shoe plans are basically the hospital plans uh, that, that the insurance sells. That is the one year increment. So one year increase by 70,000. So in total, right, out of the whole Singapore, back in 2018, only 2.7 million lives are, are covered. That means only 2.7 million lives actually have additional hospital insurance to protect them from medical expenses. And this 2.7, right, is actually only about 68% of the entire Singapore residents stay in Singapore. And, th and these Singapore residents I'm referring to is uh, Singaporeans and PR. I'm not even talking about the expatriates or, or even the, or, or the foreign workers that is, that is in Singapore. So purely on Singaporeans itself, as of end of 2018, only 68% buy a hospitalization plan, which is, which is a very mandatory basic protection plan. So th this, this, this shows a lot. This actually tells that, right, out of 68%, a good a good thirty percent of the of the population are not are not well covered. You know we are not we are not talk, even talking about financial planning. We are not even talking about wealth, uh, wealth planning. We are not even talking about retirement planning. We are just talking about a very 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 basic fundamental of hospital expenses coverage, which which the government is very, um, is very much encouraging every single citizen. Get, which is the, also the reason why they came up with the medical life to become a sphere. Let me just give you a, a, a few more statistics to show you how is the market like currently. This is a study done by Ernst and Young back in, back in 2017 and they published it in 2018 and May. So what this study tells us is that right, as of 2018, they, as of 20, end of 2017, right, there is a 355 billion gap in coverage in terms of death cover, right? So this is the amount of coverage that is missing in Singapore. Okay, that is for death. How about, they also did the same for critical illness. For critical illness, we are even looking at an even larger gap of 538 billion. So this, this, this figures just basically tells, tells us that uh, there, is, there is a lot to be done in this industry. Why is it that there's a lot to be done in the industry? Because there's just not enough um, sharing and there's not enough education to, to let people know the importance of, of risk management, the importance of being able to be well protected and well, well covered. So in terms of saturation, I, I would say it's not so much of whether, whether is, the, is, the, is there a lot of, a lot of um, advisors in the market already or is there not enough clients? It's actually how much are you willing to work? Because not every advisor is doing their best every day. And not every client is being convinced by an advisor. So there, there, there is always a gap in between. And I can say that the market is never saturated. I mean, in Singapore, if you look, over the last 50 years of independence, our network has only increased and gross domestic medium income right, has ever been increasing. Currently, it stands at about 3,008, close, close to 4,000. This is a very, very high gross domestic income that, that we're talking about. So with an increase in income, definitely more and more wealth management um, products and solutions needs to be offered to them because they need to know how to manage it. If you don't have a lot of money, maybe you will spend all of them uh, very quickly. But if you start to accumulate income, if, if you start to have money, you, 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 have, you have to have the, um, you have to be able to manage it well because that is, that is only when you get to protect protect it and then you can lead, lead a better lifestyle and you can ensure that that your family and all is, is safe. So this, this industry is a growing industry. It's not a saturating one. Yeah. Okay. Moving on, 
what are some of the skills you think people should possess coming into this industry? And what kind of skills can they actually pick up in the industry? All right. Um, skills wise, I think to, to, to me, to me when I do when I do hiring, right? When when I do uh, recruitment, one of the most important thing is uh, mindset and the attitude. Okay. So I just this one slide. All right. So in this in our in our line, right? Everything can be trained. I mean, I do not need you to be a, a degree holder in financial planning. I do not need you to be a PhD in wealth management before you can come into this industry. Because the technical skills come along the way. Training is all provided for technical skill sets. So that is that is a given. All right. But what what, we, what I cannot give you is I cannot give you your attitude. I cannot give you your mindset. So when you when you want to join this industry, right? The very first thing that that I, I will look at is I will really look into mindset. How how do you think? How do you think and and do you do you think that this is a saturating industry? Do you think that this is a hit and run industry? And do you do you, are, are you the one that is going to control the industry for your commissions? So these these are aspects that that I I will I will choose to pick up. And on top of that, is your attitude good? Do you have a strong attitude? Do you have a entrepreneur? Mindset, they have the right determination and right spirit to embark on this journey. Earlier, when we start this um, this conversation, I actually shared with me saying that this is not an easy easy industry to, to start off, but it's one that you can really learn a lot. So because because this is this is not exactly that easy, you you really need to have a good mindset. You need a good mindset. You need to have a strong determination and very good motivation to to kick start. And you need to have an open mind because you're going to listen and you're going to learn a lot. All right. So attitude is top priority. Having the right mindset, having an open mind, and being determined in this career is important. These are these are strong values that we that look up for for an individual before we are willing to put in all the resources to train and to groom him to be successful over here. Now, with all these things, what do we learn? I, I picked this up from Michael Kikes. So he, he, he shared that there are four key skill domains within the financial advisory mastery, which he call it. So these are divided into four aspects. The first one talks about competency. So in terms of competency, we are, we are really talking about the technical aspects of wealth management. So things like um, you will learn about all the wealth management solutions, you will learn about all the products and you have the in that knowledge in the finance industry. On top of that, you are also being accredited. Accredited with what? With industry certification that is recognized by MES. Right? So these are these are your competency that you can build up. As you move on to empathy, empathy is really about relationships. It's about being able to build the relationship, being able to build the trust. So you learn how to be a, a very humane human being. Where, where you really appreciate, we really appreciate each other, and, and you and you learn how to build trust such that you can actually enter into that that person and, and know, know him well enough to for him to appreciate all the advisory that you're gonna to offer to him. So that the it, it meets you see. Yeah, at least at least you're not going to be like uh one side talking about Apple and then the other one thinking about orange. No, at least when you talk about Apple, you have to think about Apple, right? Yeah, so that is that is the the empathy portion where you really learn how to understand people and learn how to listen more. Right? On the business aspects, you have then you have then management. Management, which is on the business execution. Okay, what does this, this do? So when you when you start over this career, there are some skill sets that you really need to pick up. Things like social media, things like marketing. And of course, we run a, a little bit on guerrilla marketing. Because, because we, you need to explore new avenues of doing client acquisition. So you, you, will, you will slowly pick up skill sets like, 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 like this, and then you also start to do a bit on events planning, things like uh, setting out of seminars, doing webinar, or, or even uh, running roadshows and workshops. So all these are the business execution and the management skill sets that you can pick up along the way in this industry. And last but not least, we have the final spectrum of sales in business development. So 
Okay, when it comes to sales, you learn how to pitch, you learn how to prepare, prepare, uh, prepare yourself for a, for a dialogue, prepare yourself for a sale. So you got, you got to train yourself to see, okay, what should you say first, what should you say next? And you get to practice over and over again. So communications over here is the top most uh, skill set that, that you end up with. And of course, you will also learn how to train and educate. I mean, not so much of literally having slides and train and educate, but really to educate individuals on the importance of wealth management and financial planning, right? Moving on, I think one question that many people have given this current pandemic is, do you think the wealth management industry will change post COVID-19 and how? Given the current situation, will people still consider wealth management? Right. Um, currently, because of because of COVID nineteen, the uh, this situation has really made quite a big change in the industry. But uh, what I would say is that the change is a good change. Why? Because uh, this change actually changes the the mindsets of a lot of people. Okay. Let me let me show you something. On the same report that was released um, last week, right? There is actually a take up rate of 20% increase in the total submission for under the life insurance industry from the first quarter of 2020. So what, what happens was because of COVID-19, a lot of individuals suddenly got more aware of the importance of medical and health. Earlier, I also mentioned a lot on education, a lot on um, giving teaching people, the, uh, driving to them in the importance of, of risk mentioned, the importance of uh, health coverage and medical coverage. So with this, with this COVID-19 happening, automatically, a lot of them suddenly just wake up and say, that, oh, I, I, need, I, I need to better check whether am I properly covered or not, whether do I have this aspect well taken care of or not. So you, you, business has been, has been good. Along, along this line and it has improved and it makes things a lot easier because now people are looking out for better coverage. You know, when before the circuit breaker happens, when COVID-19 first released, I received a lot of inquiries. Everybody asking me, hey Randy, am I being covered for COVID-19 or not? Hey Randy, if I come out COVID-19 and then I go to hospital, how am I, am I? Do I need to pay anything or not? Hey, uh, so everyone, everyone is very, is very, is very afraid. The, the, the fear starts to kick in because nobody remembers what they buy. <laughs> And, and, and frankly, nobody also really, really will know what they have bought. Do they, are they being protected in, in what manner? So, so the fear kicks, kicks in and everyone starts to ask, you know, uh, am I covered for COVID-19? Can I buy more insurance to cover COVID-19? COVID uh, do, do I get paid because of COVID-19? So a lot of awareness is being built up. And that's where your advisory comes in very promptly because being, being aware is one thing, but are they are they correct? Because uh, uh, you 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 hear a lot of feedback like, hey, I hear from this friend uh, that this this thing I uh, can buy this thing and then get cover for that and stuff. So a, a lot of hearsay here and there. But end of the day, what they really need is they really need the right right advisory and the true true and accurate knowledge to be passed on to them so that they can understand and they can appreciate and. One more, one thing that, that I'm glad, I mean, not, sure, not exactly glad, but, but this awareness really, really helps a lot because it, it drives through that, it's not so much of, of the sales, but it, it drives through the importance that, you know, if something happens, right, you really need to be well protected, well managed. If you, if you didn't have a financial planning in place, if you didn't manage your wealth correctly, right, when, when situations like COVID-19 occurs, right, you are the first to fall. Why? Because that you 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 have you are not prepared at all. So so now the question is, are you ready to get yourself prepared? Because there is a solution. Even if you're not prepared, there is still a solution where you can bring yourself back and get yourself prepared for the future. Right? Because COVID-19 is not going to last forever. It is it, it happens now and it's going to last maybe for a year, two years, and then it will stay on with us. But life still goes on. I mean, we, we, we still have our lives to, to lead. We still have work to do. We still have a family to feed. You will eventually still get married and have kids and all. So life still goes on. It doesn't stop because of COVID-19. And because it doesn't stop, our job at advisory doesn't stop, right? 
And this makes things a lot easier. Second aspect that changes the industry a lot is uh, technology because of circuit breaker. Okay, prior to circuit breaker, right, a lot of insurers are very skeptical to using uh, very high technology to, to make deals, to, to, close, to close cases, to do wealth management. You know, in the past, when you, when you want, to, want to meet a client, you've got to meet face-to-face. -face. You've got to meet face-to-face, -face, you've got to introduce yourself, and any signing of documents need to be done on hard copy on paper, or it need to be done in person on the, on the tablet. Like, for example, if you go to a bank, they ask you to sign on, on, on that, on that uh, pad thing, right? Yeah, so it's a digital signature, but you need to be in present to sign so that they know you're the one that is signing. Today, you don't need to meet face to face. You need to, you don't need to go down to the office, but you can do all transactions remotely. So we they, they, we have already this this circuit breaker actually forces the industry to take on a fast track digitalization path, right? And and we make use of technologies like like Zoom, like um, this is a financial planning tool that's an online tool that goes member. And then you also have uh, websites like Compact First. So with all this technology and having the regulators like MES loosening the grip on the on the tightness of, of compliance, whereby it's okay, you can don't need to sign in person so long as you acknowledge digitally through an email or through a video conferencing with a screenshot and you can verify that, that the ID is yours by doing a face, face comparison we let the case move on. So with this, with this circuit breaker, it really makes the industry a lot more efficient and very, very high productivity rate. So this, this um, I, I'm, I'm really glad, glad in the way that circuit breaker happens because it allows, allows the, the industry to understand that, hey, you do not need to make everyone meet and sit down and sign a document. You can actually allow them to sign through their PDF and they can send it back. So it becomes very tax savvy. And because of that, customers, especially on the younger, um, younger, younger age group, like um, 20s, like yourself, or 30s or, or 40s, they are very receptive because they, 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 like, they like things to be done digitally in a way as, as opposed to coming down to meet you and to sign in front of you kind of thing. Because it's, it's, it's convenient. I mean, if I need you to acknowledge, acknowledge something, I just drop you a message, I send you a link, you click on the link, and you acknowledge and you approve. Done. That's it. As simple as that. There's a few steps, and you can do it at a comfort and you have in your own pace. You don't need to arrange your by I need to be free, you need to free, and let me sit down. So, in, in, in short, this COVID situation and together with our circuit breaker builds, builds the business and enhances the industry. Of course, there is one drawback. During the circuit breaker period, it is difficult to build trust with new individuals. It's, difficult, it's not that easy to network anymore. But, um, but hopefully, that will change because circuit breaker is ending. So over the last two months of this circuit breaker period, um, it's, it's easy to do sales with existing clients, with um, close relationships that has already been built. But for me to develop a new relationship, I'm still I'm still working on it, although it's already been two months. Because frankly, I have I have I have seen I've seen individuals uh, through the through the webcam, but we haven't really met face to face. So that, that human touch end of the day is still is still very important. Which is also why I always believe that in this industry, no matter how high tech you go, you will still need human beings to do wealth advisory and wealth management. It can never be fully taken over by a robot or a computer system. Right. Okay, one last question to wrap up. Randy, what advice will you give to someone who is fresh in his or her career in the wealth management industry? What should one look out for in a potential company to work for? Well, okay. Um, my advice would be really to, to be very motivated. I mean, believe in yourself and have faith because so long as you work hard, so long, so long as you put in put in the effort and you have the right attitude, success will definitely appear, rewards will come. So do not, do not give up easily. Give yourself time, give yourself time, really. Let, 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 me, let me show you, let me share with you a simple story, all right? So um, there's this mine 
there's this mine somewhere and there are two miners who, who start to mine. All right. So the, the first miner, when he, when he started, he was very driven, very, very motivated. So he chore all the way. So he tells himself, okay, I'm going to mine non-stop. I'm not going to eat, I'm not going to stop, I'm not going to break. I'll just go and go and go and I'll give myself three days. So I will just keep mining for three days. And if I don't see result, I will leave. So he, so he decided that. So he moved also all the way in, he found nothing. Three days later, he woke up. The next miner came in. So he told himself that everybody is saying that there's, there's rewards to be taken, right? So he said, okay, I'm not going to stop. I'll just keep going. I'll keep mining. I'm going to take my breaks. I'm going to have my meals. I'm going to sleep. So I'll just mine every day at a, at a fixed period. And I'll just keep on going and going and going. So I do not burn myself out. I do not. And I give myself a longer time span. So guess what? He hit the checkpoint. Why? Because of this. See? This is the one that gives out in three days because he's tired, he's dejected, and, and, and he just he just gave up. If you were to continue to move on and you give yourself more time, because you're 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 you're, you're probably very motivated, but don't get burned out. I mean, manage, manage yourself well. Ask, ask the ask your manager, ask your ask your supervisor. Keep keep communicating with them and, and keep keep check. Make sure that uh, things are being well managed because the rewards are always there. But who gets to the reward is, is a different question altogether, right? And the next thing about is yeah, choosing the company. Okay, who well management has a lot of options, right? In, 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 the, in the market. I mean, even if you talk about financial planning, you talk about insurance, there are tons of companies available out there, and there are so many organizations within a single company. So who do you go for? Okay. To me, it's very simple. Find someone that's comfortable. Why? Because this is a this is a role that needs to be trained, needs to be groomed, and you need to learn. So unless unless you're the kind whereby you you need to fail in order to be successful and you need to really keep knocking on walls and, and you don't mind doing that for the first one to two years. That means you you keep failing and you keep getting into hardships for the first first um first first one year or two years before you even realize, ah yeah, that is the way to go. I should have done that right from day one. You know, so if you do not want to have such moments, ah yeah moments, right? Actually, what's important is that you 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 find you find a person that you're comfortable with. And, and you believe in him or her that they can bring you into this industry and he show you the ropes and, and bring you along. That is important. Why? Because if anything happens, anything you need to seek for, you need, you, you need, that, you need that individual to step in to help you. So, so you can't be working with somebody that you don't like. So you need to like the person and you, and you can't be working with somebody who ignores you all the time. So you've got to make sure that that person actually gives you the, the appropriate time and attention that you need. And you can't be following or rather you can't be working with an individual who tells you, if you read everything yourself, I'll go and Google. Oh, yeah, that's the training all there already. Just go and learn. Uh, you guys go and follow. Can we? Then that becomes very difficult, right? So what's the whole point? <laughs> I mean, this is a people industry. It's a, it's a relationship building industry. If you can't even build a relationship within the organization, how much of relationship and trust can you build with your clients out there, right? So when it comes to choosing, to, to me, most companies are all the same. It's really, it's really on a very personal point as to whether it's, are you comfortable with the company? Do you like the company? And most importantly, the person that you're working with, is he, is, is he somebody that you can put yourself to work with for the next two years, three years, or even is he a person where you can, you can put your career safely in his or her hands? Yeah, that, that's, that's what you need to answer also, right? Wow, okay. Thank you, Mr. Randy, for the insightful session. And I also hope our audience have also developed a deeper understanding about the wealth management industry. Thank you, thank you guys for taking your time out this CV period and attending um, this webinar series by IIS. And really appreciate if you guys could also leave a feedback and subscribe to our YouTube channel before you go. So let me um, bring up the slides. Yep, okay, so once again, really thank you guys for attending and have a nice day ahead.